Good evening, welcome to English News Bulletin. Happy Saturday and for this edition, we'll begin with the headlines. The delegation of German parliamentarians currently in the country has visited Congolese refugees living at the Nyabiheche camp. The Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies, Honorable Donatil Mukabarisa, points out that based on the lessons that Rwandans learned from their history, nothing can fail them since they are now united. It is always a pleasure to have your company. My name is Olive Netena to the news in details. As we begin this edition of the news, let us inform you that President Paul Kagame is in Dakar, Senegal, where he was received by President by Siru Diomai Fai and members of that country's cabinet. President Fai was elected in March with over 54% of the vote and was formally inaugurated in April. In his inaugural address, he pledged to fight corruption and reform Senegal's economy. To other matters, the delegation of German parliamentarians currently in the country has visited Congolese refugees living at the Nyabiheche camp. The parliamentarians have commended the government of Rwanda for the way it received the refugees and provided them with the basic necessities they need. The camp is home to close to 12,000 refugees and their representatives were given the opportunity to air their, their grievances to the delegation top on the list being the little allowance they received to meet their needs. The Nyabiheche camp has been receiving Congolese refugees since 2005. Moving ahead, the Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies, Honorable Donatil Mukawarisa, points out that based on the lessons that Rwandans learned from their history, nothing can fail them now that they are united. She made the remarks on Saturday during the 30th commemoration of genocide against the Tutsi, an event organized by the members of our Dahigwa Iwacho family, a family of genocide survivors who lived in Kayumba and Wujesera district. We have more in the story. <laughs> It is a ceremony that was marked by laying wreaths on the monument adorned with the names of those killed during the genocide and those killed in the marshland that was between Kayumbe and Nyamata, where many Tutsi lost their lives. In the testimony of Rachel Mcheshimana, who lost many of her family members, praised the bravery of the Nghotanyi, who rescued them and the good leadership of the country that allowed them to live again and rebuild themselves. <laughs> God has been with us. We are all grown up. We are married with kids. We have descendants now. We are no longer depressed. We truly appreciate the bravery of the Nwotani soldiers. We also highly appreciate the President of the Republic, for God gave him wisdom, and with that, he rescued Rwanda at its worst. Celestine Rutaisire, the President of the Awadahigwa Iwachu, a community of survivors in Wajisera district, explained that the idea of establishing this community of genocide survivors in Karambi and Kayumba came in 2014. Despite the bad history they went through on a date like this, they expressed gratitude to the former RPA Ingotanyi soldiers who rescued them. We salute the RPF in Hotani soldiers and we want them to know that we are now at peace and we thank them greatly. We thank God that sent us the Hotani. We also thank the President of the Republic, who also was at the forefront during the liberation struggle, His Excellency Paul Kagame. We also thank the government of Rwanda that established and supports these commemoration activities. The Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies, Honorable Mukawarisa Donatil, points out that the Tutsi who were killed during the genocide in Wujesera district have shown courage since 1959 when they started being persecuted. She also praises the courage of survivors who chose to live and not to be overwhelmed by depression. <laughs> Survivors of the genocide against the Tutsi drew patience and strength from this. They have been resilient and they have been finding courage within themselves, drawing from the resilience they had after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. You always fought so hard to look forward to a brighter future. You refused to die and you strived to build a country that we were able to gain. And in unity, we built our country. 
twubaka igihugu cyacu mufatanye butajegajega Honorable Donatil Mukawarisa also emphasizes that the current state of Rwanda is commendable, acknowledging the progress made thus far. Furthermore, she expresses optimism for the future. We appreciate the fact that we have been able to pass through this journey in the past 30 years with the help of good leadership. We also appreciate the good governance that is based on every resident without discriminations. We learned so many lessons from our history and nothing can fail us because of our unity and serving the country and patriotism. We should always follow the government's program that our government continues to establish. The Yuka organization in Mujisera district says that some of the urgent matters to consider include taking care of those with mental health problems resulting from the genocide, taking care of elderly genocide survivors who were sole survivors in their families, and preserving the history of the genocide. Moving ahead, the Ibuka, the umbrella organization of genocide survivors, is requesting for there to be a regulation of legal practice act on the law governing persons and family, calling for streamlined legal processes to obtain death records for loved ones lost during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Current court procedures often cause trauma and difficulties for survivors. Take a look. Judith Mutoniwawo, a woman residing in Gasawa district, Tinya Sekta Gasharu Sel survived the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Before the genocide, she lived with both parents and seven siblings, and she was married with three children. However, the genocide took the lives of many of her family members, leaving her with only one sister and two children along with her husband. Judith encountered numerous challenges during the process of registering her name as the inheritor of her parents' property due to the lack of death records, documentation, of his siblings. After the genocide, my sister and I, both survivors, spent a considerable amount of time without utilizing our plot of land for agricultural purposes. We began to question the utility of the land and considered selling it. Since my sister has back problems and couldn't easily manage the process, she granted me power of attorney to handle the matter. However, when I initiated the process, it proved to be challenging. I was informed that I needed to involve the court. I filed my case and engaged in court proceedings. As we neared the conclusion, I was informed that I also needed to deregister my deceased siblings, aside from obtaining death certificates for my parents. They said it is done to ensure there would be no future legal issues regarding the ownership of the land. While initially I had only obtained death certificates for my parents, it was now imperative to deregister all deceased siblings to establish my entitlement as the landowner. Judith highlights the significant challenge of obtaining the required evidence in court to establish ownership rights to their property. She explains that some of the evidence, such as detailing how their relatives were killed and providing proof of their burial, is particularly difficult to obtain due to the nature of the genocide. Additionally, noting the fact that many survivors, even after 30 years, have not been able to locate the bodies of their loved ones who were killed during the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. Despite three decades since the genocide, Judith is still navigating court proceedings in search of these elusive documents. She is currently facing her final trial on May 14th, underscoring the prolonged and arduous journey survivors like her face in securing these documents for various purposes. The prospect of having to prove the deaths of all my siblings deeply traumatized me. Overwhelmed by emotions, I ran to a nearby corner where memories flooded back and I couldn't hold back my tears. The weight of the situation made me feel like fleeing and in a moment of distress, I ran away. Both the customer care officer and the district administrator noticed and chased after me. After that, they helped me. This is how I was able to navigate the process of the registering my siblings. Article 106 of the Law Governing Persons and Family states that death is declared within a period of 30 days following the occurrence thereof upon presentation of a medical certificate of death 
or a death record issued by the competent authority. The declaration is made in the presence of two witnesses. When this requirement is not fulfilled, all other procedures must be addressed through the court system. Dr. Phil Batgakwenzire, the president of the Umbrella Organization of the Genocide Survivors, Iwuka, highlights how this requirement poses numerous obstacles for survivors in obtaining these essential documents. Adding to the difficulties, survivors are asked to provide witnesses to testify on their behalf. Unfortunately, locating such individuals proves to be a difficult task, as many have relocated to different areas. Additionally, in some cases, individuals residing in a particular area may be unaware of the genocide histories in that specific location. Secondly, it is indeed a significant challenge and cause for concern, particularly for survivors who have lost a large number of family members. The process of deregistration proves to be hard as it involves numerous court appearances resulting in considerable expenses. Furthermore, court proceedings often require survivors to recount the harrowing events surrounding the deaths of their loved ones, leading to trauma. Due to the ongoing challenges faced by survivors, the EUCA organization is urging for the regulation of legal practice concerning the law governing persons and family. This regulation aims to facilitate the process for survivors to obtain death records of their loved ones who were killed during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Many survivors are in possession of documents issued by Farish, the Genocide Survivors Fund, demonstrating their status as survivors of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. These documents not only serve to verify that they are indeed survivors, but also indicate the loss of their loved ones during the genocide. I believe it is essential for the sector administration to take a proactive role in these cases rather than leaving survivors to navigate the process alone, which often leads to further trauma. Moreover, there should be legal provisions mandating a notice period, perhaps two or more years, during which individuals can seek out these documents. This would allow for outreach efforts to assist survivors in locating and obtaining the necessary documentation, easing the burden of them and ensuring they receive the support they need. Dr. Neziriyayo Foster, the President of the Supreme Court, emphasizes the necessity of collaboration between the justice system and the EU Umbrella Organization to reach a lasting solution to this issue. Due to the fact that Ibuka has more information on this ongoing issue, we request them to collaborate with us so that we can sit together and discuss about this deeply and find a solution for it. This is an issue that we must address quickly and this is not hard to solve since where there is a will, it is easy to resolve any kind of problem that may arise. We will see what can be done if it is the court proceedings or if we can find any other way to solve it without considering these procedures. Survivors require these documents not only for inheritance purposes but also for a variety of other essential needs. To other matters, today Rwandans living in Western Australia or, and Friends of Rwanda marked the 30th commemoration of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. During this commemoration, the first ever memorial of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in the Asia-Pacific region was unveiled. In his speech, the High Commissioner of Rwanda to Australia, Jean de Dieu Ouihangagne, called on the international community to ramp up efforts in fighting hate speech and genocide denial. from the PEAC community Central African Energy Pool want an international interconnection between the power pools of Central Africa and those of East Africa. These experts met this indication after visiting the Rusumo Falls hydroelectric plant shared between Rwanda and Burundi and Tanzania. Charlene Furaha with the details. The members of the Central African Energy Pool 
held a discussion regarding the possibility of connecting the Rusumo hydroelectric power plant to other power poles in East and Central African countries. The managing director of Rusumo Power Company Limited, Nare Karitanyi, testifies to the possibility of this mission and its benefit for countries in Central Africa. Uh, yes, we had a good discussion. Uh, of course, the, the PS of uh, the PS, uh, the East Af Central Africa Power Pool is very much interested in, in linking uh, the, uh, the Central Africa Power Pool and the East Africa Power Pool. I think there are some potential areas of collaboration. Um, you know, we talked about uh, uh, the link in Camagnola. We talked uh, uh, maybe looking at some uh, adding new lines connecting Burundi uh, to DRC and connecting uh, uh, Burundi is already linked to Rusumu. So there's this discussion of uh, having potential excess power that comes from East Africa uh, transiting via Rusumu going taking it to the Central Africa Power Pool. Central Africa Power Pool is uh, include the 11 countries, so it's a big market for us. Uh, and I think it gives us an, uh, an impetus to maybe to, to, to go faster, to look for more opportunities similar to this one. The permanent secretary of the PEC community, Atade Azarak Mugro, was delighted with the implementation of this mission and congratulates Rwanda for the progress made in its development as well as for the advancement of its electricity sector. He underlines the importance of other Central African countries following Rwanda's example. Rwanda is well positioned in its electricity generation industry. Whenever I visit Rwanda, I'm pleased to see the country's ongoing development and especially the absence of electricity outage problems, I like the fact that many other countries where such issues persist. We hope that other countries in Central Africa can emulate the Rwanda's progress. This is why we must make efforts to connect these power lines, ensuring that electricity deprived nations also gain access to these vital resources. This hydroelectric power plant is located on the border between Rwanda and Tanzania at Rusumo. It contains three turbines and crosses the Akagera River, shared between Rwanda, Burundi and Tanzania. It has an electricity production capacity of 81 megawatts. The construction of this hydroelectric project began in 2017 and should be operational before the end of May this year, according to the Director General of the Rusumo Power Company Limited. Charlene Furaha, RTV News. Back to commemoration activities, as we were saying, Rwandans living in Western Australia and Friends of Rwanda marked the 30th commemoration of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi during this commemoration. The first ever memorial of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Asia Pacific region was unveiled. In his speech, the High Commissioner of Rwanda to Australia, Jean de Dieu Ouihangagne, called on the international community to ramp up efforts in fighting hate speech and genocide, denial Serge Nore with the details. To kickstart the event to mark the 30th commemoration of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, participants took part in the walk to remember, which concluded at the Sterling Civic Garden, which is home to the first ever memorial of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in the Asia Pacific region. Linda Iriza, the Vice President of Rwandan Community Abroad Perth Incorporate, shared her thoughts on the relevance of this memorial, which has been in the works for three years. This memorial stands as a symbol of resilience in the face of the unimaginable tragedy of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. For those who never had the privilege of laying their loved ones to rest, may this be a sacred space that you can find comfort and peace. And for all of us, may it serve as a reminder of our collective responsibility to uphold the sanctity of life and strive for a world where such atrocities never occur again. Representing Roger Cook, the governor of the province of Western Australia, Meredith 
Hamad commended the Rwandan community in Western Australia for their unwavering commitment to preserving the history of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. She noted that it is important for the Rwandan community in Western Australia to continue commemorating to help people in the state know about what occurred in Rwanda. It is important that your community continues to come together to commemorate the events of 1994, to gather at this memorial and to tell the story of the many hundreds of thousands of people who lost their life at that time, to tell the story of those who were forced to flee, to tell the story of the impact that that has had and continues to have. Because without your commitment to telling that story uh, and commemorating those events, the rest of the community may never learn. And I think that would be a terrible, terrible outcome. The High Commissioner of Rwanda to Australia, Jean de Dieu Wihangani, in his remarks urged the international community to ramp up its efforts in fighting hate speech and genocide denial. Describing hate propaganda and genocide denial as serious threats facing Rwanda and the world, the High Commissioner noted that more should be done to address this problem. He reminded attendees that the tragedy that befell Rwanda in 1994 began with incitement to hatred, divisionism and discrimination, adding that left unchecked the intensity of hatred, discrimination and genocide denial increases with the resulting consequences becoming even deadlier. He underscored that the responsibility is on all members of the international community to deal with this issue before the situation gets out of hand. Over 300 attendees, including state officials, academics, community leaders, Rwandans living in Western Australia and friends of Rwanda attended the commemorative event at the Stirling Adriatic Centre. During the event, a genocide survivor shared the horrific account of the ordeal that Tutsi families went through before being rescued by the RPF in Hotenyi, upon it stopping the genocide. Now to other matters, members of the RPF in Otani Party at the settlement level in Musanze district have commended all that has been achieved in the country over the last seven years and committed to play their part in ensuring that the presidential parliamentary elections in July are a success. They have also reviewed the party's objective for the next term of five years, noting that the achievements of the past must not be an excuse to become lax in their continued drive towards long-term development. During the General Assembly, at the settlement level, new members were also received into the party. Moving ahead, the Centric Democratic Party of Rwanda has urged its members to play their part in the coming general elections and support the candidate of the RPF in Otani Party in the presidential elections. The call was made during the party's training that brought together members from the northern and eastern provinces as well as Kigali City. The members were called upon to be exemplary in the way they conduct themselves during the elections. Moving ahead, the Democratic Green Party of Rwanda has announced the names of the 64 people who will be vying for parliamentary seats on its behalf in July. The party has also officially approved its manifesto, this during its political bureau meeting here in Kigali. Green Party members have expressed confidence in their ability to win seats during the parliamentary elections and say they look forward to casting their votes. The party will make its manifesto public in the near future. And the story brings us to the end of tonight's bulletin. On behalf of the technical and news production team that helped us prepare this for you, thank you for being part of our news today. Have a restful weekend. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>